Hello and welcome back to Between the Hashes, our weekly college football prediction show coming to you from Los Angeles, California. I'm your host, Matt Keim, and today we're getting ready for actually what is kind of a pretty quiet weekend in college football. So I'm going to spend the, most of this video just reacting to what some of the bigger stories that we've seen, especially out of week two, but just kind of in general for the first couple of weeks. But before I get into any of that, remember to give us a like, comment, subscribe on Empire Media. That's A-M-P-I-R-E Media. You can check it out for this show and for our, your up, updates on the Washington Commanders. So I want to start with this. The biggest story coming out of week two, in my opinion, is Texas going on the road and beating Alabama in Tuscaloosa by double digits. For those of you that have may watched my week two video, which was a dive into that game, you'll know that I actually kind of favored Texas for the most part. I thought they would cover. I had a hard time seeing them win just because beating Alabama, no matter how flawed of an Alabama team, in Tuscaloosa is never an easy thing to do. I think the last team to do it was LSU in 2019, and we know how that team ended up. From the way, from returning experience to sheer numbers to the just the way that some of the guys that were on this Texas, that were on these respective teams played last year and then looked in the first couple weeks of the season, I kind of thought Texas was the better team. I just had a hard time seeing Texas actually pull it off because how many times has that program been in that position since since the later Mac Brown years and then they fall on their face in one aspect or another? And in fact, I'm still kind of half expecting Texas to drop a game to a completely random team, uh, normally in the Big 12, that they probably shouldn't. Like, I don't know, maybe they lose to TCU again. Um, Texas Tech is, uh, by the way, much better than their 0-2 record, so may maybe Texas Tech pulls off an upset if uh, those two end up playing. Here's what I think we can conclude based on that one game. Quinn Ewers has grown tremendously as a quarterback. His deep ball has gotten a lot better. He just, he's uh, shed some weight. He, he seems a lot more athletic, a lot more in control of that offense. This is probably the biggest win of this is probably the biggest win of coach Steve Sarkeesian's career as well just as as a head coach especially against the man who revived his prospects as a football coach. I I think most impressively it's the way that Texas won. They won at the line of scrimmage. They sacked quarterback Jalen Milrow five times overall, and, and honestly, it could have been worse. Jalen Milrow was able to show off his athleticism, but honestly, his numbers weren't anything to write home about. He completed roughly half of his passes, had two touchdowns, two picks. It's a departure from what we're normally used to seeing under the last 10 or so years at that position under Nick Saban. Like I said, his four previous predecessors not only all got drafted, all four of them are still starters in, in the league, and one of them was in the MVP conversation as recently as last year. I don't want to attack any one specific player per se, but it just doesn't seem like Milrow is quite up to up to the level of these past guys, and I don't think that's necessarily an insult. It just goes to show how special th those guys were, especially Bryce Young. And I think with Alabama, there were holes in that Alabama team la even the last couple of years, especially at the skill position and some of the line, some of the line play. Bryce Young masked a lot of real flaws with that team that I just don't think Milrow, so far at least has the talent to overcome. I think that was a lot of what was on display this past Saturday. This is a very new team for Alabama, and they're gonna go through more growing pains than I think a lot of people anticipated. At the end of the day, it's still Nick Saban. It's still Alabama. They're still something like a 90% blue chip ratio. They should be fine. Going back to Texas. Texas has at least 10 guys whose names should be called next spring. And I don't think that's an exaggeration. When Ewers looked good, Worthy looked good, their entire offensive line played pretty well. Their front seven dominated that game. Five sacks on Milrow. The secondary stepped up when they needed to, in including some very critical interceptions at some very timely moments. Is Texas back as a program? I haven't the slightest clue. Are they back this year? Yes. You're gonna be hard pressed to find a team with a better win on their resume than what Texas has right now. And what Texas has done is that they have given themselves a very long runway 
because like I said, I, I said earlier, I don't necessarily put it past Texas to stumble against a team they really shouldn't sometime this year. Maybe, maybe that stumbling doesn't even happen until the Big 12 title game, kind of like with TCU and Kansas State last year. Even if Texas doesn't even win the Big 12, they should still be one of the top four teams assuming they can keep it up. They have success, now how do they handle it? I think a big part of it for Texas is that they brought almost everybody back on offense. They brought a ton of guys back on defense. Texas is currently ranked in the top four and they have very much earned their place there. So is Texas back for now? Yes. You know who's not back? Miami. I will qualify this by saying that Tyler Van Dyke played a good game. He played a really good game and he is looked a lot better at quarterback so far than this time last year. Part of that is due to an offensive coordinator change and some of it's just another year of growth and experience and another year of Mario Cristobal getting his guys down at Miami. I gotta be honest, I had a hard time predicting this game. It was kind of a coin flip prediction last week with the Tex with Texas A&M losing by double digits to Miami on the road. I don't trust, I still don't trust either of those teams. Like Nobody does less with more than Texas A&M. Jimbo Fisher is, is in his sixth year as head coach there, and he, he's never won the he's never even won the division, not once. That insane contract that he has, and the amount of def especially on the front seven, the defensive line talent, which is potentially one of the biggest indicators of who's going to win a national title from year in and year out, and they probably have that most like the most on paper talent, they just never doing anything with it. And so it's a little bit hard for me to count a win over the, and this isn't necessarily Miami's fault per se. It's a little bit hard for me to see them beat a program like that and then say, and, and then anoint them in the ACC, especially because Florida State looks really good. Florida State should win the ACC. I know I said that Texas has the best win in the country. Florida State has the second best win in the country, or at least until like USC, Notre Dame, Ohio State, and Michigan all start playing each other. It's it's a little bit hard to see Miami competing at that level until they can do it consistently. I will say it's a really good start, and I really like what I saw. And the, the most impressive thing is that Miami was down double digits early in that game and they had the mental fortitude to withstand that storm and then come back from a 17-7 early deficit and then storm back, take the lead, and never look back. It's hard to do that psychologically, and I think that's the biggest thing for Miami going forward is sometimes when a team can just turn the corner like that, good things can happen. So is that the case with this Miami team? I don't know. And I think it's too early to say. Speaking of too early, let's talk about Ohio State. Ohio State has solidified their starter at quarterback in Kyle McCord. Kyle McCord has gotten the nod in the last couple games, but Devin Brown has been coming in for a handful of drives here in the Indiana game, a handful of drives there against Youngstown State. But now McCord's been given the keys full time, so we should see more consistency out of that position soon. The numbers haven't been great. The offensive line play hasn't been great. They've been rushing the ball with way less efficiency. They've been calling a lot more outside runs and short screen passes, basically not running inside the tackles as much as they do, which is a little bit bizarre because they have some of the best running back talent in the entire country. It, like even against Youngstown State, they were almost hesitant to run the ball in there at certain point. Is it indicative of a larger problem? I don't know. What I do know is that most of that offensive line is now in the, most of the offensive line that Ohio State had last year, that team was averaging over seven yards of play on offense. Most of that team is in the NFL. Their quarterback, CJ Stroud, was drafted second overall. That sort of, that sort of continuity, that sort of experience takes time to build up. Now, it's not like McCord's a young freshman. He's been in college for a few years. He, he's even gotten a couple of relief starts when uh, CJ Stroud got hurt early on in his first year as a starter. It's not like we're running this, we're running someone who's playing high school football 12 months ago out there. I honestly think that the jury is just out. You can't, you can't make any definitive statements. However, not this week, but next week, they have one of the biggest games of the season. They go to South Bend, Indiana, and play Notre Dame. They play a quarterback who has been in college forever, a quarterback who with surrounded with much less talent than most teams in the country with Sam Hartman at Wake Forest, threw for six touchdowns on Clemson last year. I think Notre Dame's one of the top four or five teams in the country so far through the first couple of games of the season. They haven't played too many people, but 
they were amazing defensively last year. They're per they're good defensively this year, and now they took one of the best college quarterbacks from last year and added him to their roster. That's something to watch out for for Ohio State. So Ohio State has to get it together, and they have to get it together fast. So with all that out of the way, I do still have some games to talk about. I'm not going to spend as much time talking about these games because it should be a fairly quiet week in college. I do still think there's a couple of interesting matchups, and I do want to talk about them. So let's start with the lightning round. Number one, 14 goes to Starkville to take on Will Rogers and Mississippi State. One of the things that concerned me with LSU, and these concerns have doubled since the Florida State game, is their defense, is notably their secondary. Will Rogers comes from the Air Raid offense. He's going to set a whole bunch of records in the SEC. He threw for a million yards last year. He should probably do it again this year. The line is 9.5. Mississippi State's at home. As of right now, LSU 9.5. LSU should win and then should rebound. I still believe in LSU this year, at least to win the West. Number two, another Power 5 non-conference matchup. Kansas State goes to Columbia, Missouri to play the Missouri Tigers. The interesting thing is that this line is only three and a half, which is actually super surprising, given that Missouri squeaked out a win against a team that Alabama by, beat by 50 two weeks ago. Kansas State actually does have some returning talent. Will Howard has a ton of experience at quarterback. I'd be surprised to see Kansas State not cover here. I like Kansas State here. I like Kansas State in the points. Apparently the theme is road favorites this week. Number three, Michael Penix goes back to his Big Ten roots to play the Michigan State Spartans. So far, Michael Penix Jr. has looked like one of the best quarterbacks in the country, and that trend should continue this weekend. Washington is favored by 16 against an undefeated Michigan State team that just lost their coach. For those of you that might not be familiar, Mel Tucker, and I'm not going to go into too much detail on this, Mel Tucker has found himself in a scandal and probably is out of a job. I always have to wonder what a team's headspace is at during a period like that. And so Michigan State might be reeling more than a little bit. I know I don't normally go for bigger lines here. I just think this is a bad team for Michigan State to play at this point in time. Washington wins. They cover. And our final lightning round game is another SEC game. Tennessee goes to the swamp and plays Florida. Now, Florida had a rough opening day against a Utah team that honestly hasn't looked all that impressive. To be fair to Utah, they're playing their third-string quarterback. Utah was missing almost 10 starters that game for one injury concern or another. Let's leave Utah out of it for a moment. Leaving Utah and their myriad injuries out of it for a moment. Graham Mertz, he was never a world beater at Wisconsin. He's done decent at Florida through two games, but the better of those two games was against McNeese. The line's only six and a half, and it's, um, I'm honestly really, and that, that should go to show just how much, how tough of an environment the swamp truly is to play at given that it's only a one touchdown spread i like tennessee i like the points like i said road favorites it's the theme here and that brings us to our headliner game of the week minnesota goes to chapel hill and plays north carolina on face value this is kind of a strange game to pick as a headliner i want to talk about north carolina for a few minutes because for as much hype as miami's getting as the official second best team in the acc i think that title actually belongs to north carolina and i really want to see what a match between them and florida state would turn out to be so to start with north carolina they opened the year with a they opened the year with a win over south carolina in what was mac brown's hundredth win as north carolina's coach for those that might not be familiar, Mac Brown was the coach in the 90s, and he, he always had a pretty good team with them. So beyond winning 100 games and becoming the winningest coach in North Carolina's football history is that he is now the only head coach ever at the college level to win 100 games at two different programs, Texas and now North Carolina. The other reason to watch North Carolina is Drake May is a fantastic quarterback. The man's a walking highlight reel, and while he's not like Patrick Mahomes light the way Caleb Williams is, he should still be the second quarterback off the board. This should actually be a pretty good litmus test of where both he and Minnesota are in this week. So, so far, Minnesota has a top 10 ranked defense through two games. And here's the, and here's, again, it's too early in the season to make certain definitive conclusions. They played Nebraska and Eastern Michigan and gave up like a grand total of 16 points between the two games. They're only giving up 200 plus yards on defense a game right now. It's a little hard to take that number seriously when you realize that the offense, that the defense has had to play against those teams. But you know what? 
they have those numbers they haven't lost yet and they're about to get punched in the mouth by one of the better offenses in college right now and so if they can do it they'll solidify that reputation as a top defense that's what's at stake for Minnesota. And if they really are that top of a defense, then it should be a really, really good test for Drake May. But the, the, strangely enough, the line's only hovering around minus eight, despite the fact that North Carolina's at home. I find that really bizarre. North Carolina's averaging over 160 yards more on offense a game right now than Minnesota is. Minnesota is has replaced a longtime starter at quarterback they have a new guy coming out obviously there's growing pains now pj fleck has had a respectable program there again i'm highlighting this game more to talk about north carolina than i am to talk about minnesota i'd be stunned if this game was as close as eight i like north carolina to win i like north carolina to cover so that's all i have for you guys this week like i said it's a little bit of a we're a little bit on the shorter side this week i think this was just a good week to begin to draw some inferences based on what we've seen so far what do you guys think what do you think of texas miami alabama ohio state north carolina florida state lsu just and so on forth down the line whatever you think let us know and, as always, tune in for your updates on the Washington Commanders with the John Kime Report, coming to you every week on Empire Media. So give us a like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll be back this time next week.